Crossing Over, a guide to collecting primitive art for the contemporary art collector. Primitive and Primitivism. The story of how primitive objects evolved from curiosities to artifacts to objects of art at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century is a common theme. To explain these events, one must have a perceived understanding of primitive and primitivism. Primitivism is the belief that life was better or more moral during the early stages of mankind or among primitive peoples, and it has deteriorated with the growth of civilization. It is a response to the perennial question of whether the development of complex civilizations and technologies has benefited or harmed mankind. In visual art, there are several meanings to the term primitivism. One refers to art by either prehistoric or, in general, non-Western peoples. In this such use, words as primitive or primitivism might appear in quotes. This is to suggest inherent inaccuracy or ethnocentricity. Another type of primitivism is the work done by artists who might be self-taught. Naive is a better or a more correct term for this instance. The term primitivism is often applied to professional painters working in this style of naive or folk art, such as Paul Klee and Wazili Kandinsky. Yet a third instance of primitive refers to the borrowing of visual forms from non-Western or prehistoric peoples. An example would be Paul Gauguin's inclusion of Tahitian motifs in paintings and Picasso's use of African imagery. Borrowings from primitive art has been important in the development of modern art. European colonial expansion, or colonialism, is at the vortex of theories concerning primitivism. Geographically, Europeans declared that primitive savages, as they were unfairly referred to, originated in Central and Southern Africa, the Americas, and Oceania. Primitivism and Modern Art the term primitivism is used in modern art to describe artistic tendencies found throughout its development, beginning with symbolism and Art Nouveau in the 1890s through American Abstract Expressionism in the 1940s. Unlike these art movements, however, primitive art has no organized group of artists or identifiable style arising from a particular historical moment. Rather, it brings together various artistic reactions to ideas of what is primitive during the course of the period. Primitivism in modern art has traditionally been seen in the context of an artist's use of nominally primitive artifacts as models during the development of their own work. This began in France and Germany in the beginning of the 20th century and quickly spread throughout Europe and to the United States. Subsequent generations of modern artists have been inspired by an ideal image of the primitive, largely drawn from their own imagination and by the multitude of individual works of African, Oceanic, and pre-Columbian sculpture seen from a very personal perspective. Nevertheless, primitive art forms were still largely ignored by art historians, who could not deal with it in their accustomed terms. At the same time, anthropologists had studied technique, social function, presumed evolution, and sometimes aesthetics of primitive art, but were generally unaware of modern art. For the general public, primitive art was vague, crude, and simple, and since modern art also seemed to strive for the simple and unsophisticated, the two were often confused. It is widely accepted today, as it was not in 1938, that the art of the so-called primitive peoples is not itself primitive, since it is neither technically crude nor aesthetically unsubtle. Therefore, there is no need for us to establish a parallel between primitive art and modern art, but rather the opposite. First, to show why modern artists turn to the primitive for inspiration, and second, to demonstrate that however much or little primitive art has been a source for modern art, the two in fact have almost nothing in common. Primitive Art Influence on Picasso and the School of Paris The historic 1984 exhibition, Primitivism in the 20th Century, The Affinity of the Tribal and Modern at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, is considered one of the most important exhibitions of the 20th century. Culturally, it was a monumental success, not only because of the massive amount of non-European works assembled, but also because of the controversy it spawned. 
Affinity of the tribal and modern was an idea based on William Rubin's identification of the shared characteristics of African and Oceanic works of art and a series of works by Picasso. It was determined that Cota reliquary figures from Gabon, which were brought to the Musée de Lome in the 1880s, could have been a source of Picasso's inspiration. An important event recorded by the American expat writer Gertrude Stein in the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas in 1913 mentions how Matisse purchased a small African sculpture from a curio shop on the way to visit her home in 1907. Matisse showed the Vili figure from the Democratic Republic of Congo to Picasso, and Picasso later admitted that it led to various visits to the African collections at the Trocadero beginning in June 1907. The African sculptures, Picasso said, had helped him to understand his purpose as a painter, which was not to entertain with decorative images, but to mediate between perceived reality and the creativity of the human mind, to be freed or exercised from a fear of the unknown by giving form to it. As a result of his introduction to primitive art, Picasso began thinking and taking a more sculptural approach to his painting, resulting in strong animalistic images. In 1907, Picasso painted Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Picasso also completed a portrait of Gertrude Stein, repainting the face many times, ultimately ending his rose period, resulting in a hard mask-like style reminiscent of the archaic sculptures from his Iberian homeland. Matisse, who also frequented the African display at the Trocadero, visited North Africa in 1906. Upon his return, he painted two versions of the young sailor, in which one version featured naturalistically contoured facial features, while the second was clearly a more rigid, abstract appearance, similar to that of a mask. Some considered these events the birth of Cubism, and a defining role in the course of modern art throughout the 20th century thus questioning the very basis of European modernism and its existence without African and Oceanic influences. During the Cubist period, Picasso continued to incorporate mask-faced figures with fragmented geometric shapes, featured in works such as Bust of a Man in 1908, A Woman's Head in 1909, and The Standing Female Nude in 1910 which is arguably the greatest Cubist drawing ever created. Man Ray, African Art in the Modernist Lens Although a number of photographers in the early to mid 20th century occasionally used African figures and masks in novel ways, Man Ray was arguably the period's most prolific creator inspired by non-Western objects in general and African sculpture in particular. Man Ray was one of the most studied, exhibited, and analyzed figures of modern photography, but his body of work concerning African art sculpture was almost completely ignored and absent from his scholarship. The images that follow highlight the key role photography played in bringing images of non-Western art to the fore. While the activities of Pablo Picasso, Gauguin, Matisse, and Gio Cometti have dominated discussions on modernist primitivism, Parallel photographic activities have yet to receive the full attention they merit. Collecting Tribal Art During the Second Half of the Twentieth Century The second half of the twentieth century, after the Second World War, was the heyday of collecting primitive art. During this period, an astounding number of varieties of traditional or classical figurative sculptures and masks from Africa and Oceania flowed from the Global South to the North Atlantic countries, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, commonly referred to as the West. Private and museum collections in the United States grew at a rapid pace, while European collectors and museums had already accumulated important holdings. The Rise of Oceanic Art during the 1960s and 70s, there were many expeditions to Oceania to collect and study art. Possibly the most famed of expeditions was that of Michael C. Rockefeller. After returning home from an expedition with Harvard's Peabody Museum, 
Rockefeller returned to New Guinea to study the Azmat and collect Azmat art. At the time, Rockefeller explained, it's the desire to do something adventurous, at a time when frontiers in the real sense of the word are disappearing. Ironic indeed, considering it was Michael C. Rockefeller himself who disappeared in the Azmat region of New Guinea and his body was never found. He was legally pronounced dead in 1964. Towards the end of the 20th century, a controversy grew over the use of the terms primitive, tribal, indigenous, etc., as well as the ideas of cultural patrimony. There is a strong advocacy among scholars in the field that these terms are hurtful and or demeaning. This ultimately led to the adaptation of the French term arts premieres. In the United States, major galleries and auction houses have abandoned the terms primitive and tribal and adapted to simply the arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. The French also created the term provenance. Provenance of works of fine art, antiques, and antiquities often assumes great importance. Documented evidence of provenance for an object can help to establish that it has not been altered in any way, is not a forgery, a reproduction, stolen, or looted. The quality of provenance of an important work of art can make a considerable difference to its selling price in the market. This is affected by the degree of certainty of the provenance, the status of past owners as collectors, and in many cases by the strength of evidence that an object has not been illegally excavated or exported from another country. The 21st century. Many believe that the Rockefeller generation invented a phenomenon that three unrelated regions of the world have some deep connection with each other, all being primitive. Although there are legitimate arguments that museums such as the Metropolitan and other institutions may have sorted primitive objects to their own labels of satisfaction, they feel there is a much bigger and maddening issue here than the terms tribal, primitive, indigenous, premiers, etc., and that the problem is so fundamental and structural that it renders museums, curriculum, and collected relating industries antiques in their own right. But a new generation of dealers and galleries will take on the new scholarship coming out of mostly an American academy, the U.S. for all its embarrassing troubles with reactionary provincialism in national politics, has made repeated efforts in higher education to fairly reframe the study of cultures beyond the West and redirect the enjoyment of objects as appropriate and unique to their time and place. Crossing over, how to collect arts premieres in the 21st century. Jean Fritz, the worldwide director of African and Oceanic Art at Sotheby's, recently commented, Today we see a depth in the global bidding and buying, as well as a great influx of new collectors entering the field at all levels of the market. It is clear that the market is truly global, and that it has expanded far beyond the traditional American and European collecting bases. We had a strong participation from new buyers, some of whom participate at the highest level as well as crossover collectors of whom are familiar with other collecting areas like contemporary art and are entering the field of African and Oceanic art to embrace works of the highest quality. The approach to acquiring high quality arts premieres depends on the collector's level of experience. However, collectors need not be experts to acquire a beautiful piece of art they love. New collectors can become informed by visiting museums, reading books, reviewing auction catalogs, and spending time in galleries that specialize in their particular interests. Quality, provenance, and investment value are important, of course, but if you enjoy an object because it makes you feel good or makes your life more interesting, you're collecting it for the right reasons. The arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas can create a dialogue and a conversation and generate emotion. Experienced collectors can spend millions of dollars for a piece at an auction. For example, this Lega four-headed figure from the Democratic Republic of Congo sold at Sotheby's in May 2010 for $2,210,500, more than 40 times the expected price to an anonymous phone bidder. Three months before that in Paris, March 2010, this highly important Maori nephrite pendant from New Zealand sold for €372,750, more than $497,695. Be selective. New collectors should remember that selectively acquiring a few high-quality pieces is preferable to amassing a large collection of mediocre pieces. However, you should follow your instincts and buy what pleases your senses. 
Look for culture and not a fashion trend. Never collect for someone else's approval, social validation, or purely as a monetary investment. The greatest satisfaction of collecting is living with the acquisitions. Some collectors refer to collecting as a profoundly private passion, a love affair, a religious quest, or a deeply pleasurable secret. A collector's motive is always unique because we all respond to art in an individual way. You'll find the arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas have powerful artistic expressions with depth and meaning, and often magical characteristics. People collect it for a range of good reasons. The thrill of finding a precious jewel amongst a pile of junk, the sense of adventure in viewing objects made by ancient peoples in distant lands, the satisfaction of connecting spiritually with the soul of an artist whose reflection has culminated in a physical manifestation for us to cherish and admire. This simple understanding of the art of collecting art can result in much pleasure and enjoyment and lead to a sense of cultural and artistic awareness that can be shared with others. It is my passion and privilege to present and enlighten new generations with fascinating and interesting objects of art that are wonderful to live with, without having to label them as primitive or tribal, but to explain the beauty and importance from my point of view and relate them to works of art that my generation can understand. Visit my current Art Miami exhibition booth A63 for a look into the cultures of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, as well as an interesting look at an art form from New Guinea known as Pop Tribal Art, consisting of a selection of large wooden war shields from the central highlands of New Guinea, an area that was isolated from the modern world until 1933. These large shields are traditionally made from the trunk of a tapi tree, which was split, smoothed, and painted. Typically, these shields had a circle in the middle representing the sun, or human spirit, with rays emanating from the center. Years later, after being isolated from the modern world for centuries, these fierce warriors adopted Lee Falk's phantom comic book character as an alter ego and repainted old war shields with the strikingly buff image of the phantom representing the man who cannot die.